Have UFOs crashed on Earth? Have we made alien contact? Is the US government covering up a massive UFO conspiracy? Behind me is one of the most secret military bases in the world, deep in the heart of the Nevada desert. The Groom Lake test site, also known as Area 51 or Dreamland, has been home to US stealth projects since the Second World War. However, in recent years, a more disturbing story has emerged, and that is that the government is back engineering recovered alien spacecraft. Tonight, based on evidence given to us by top military personnel, engineers and scientists, we can exclusively reveal the UFO technology that's being developed behind me. It's a story the US government has tried to cover up for half a century. The truth behind Dreamland. I am convinced, based on my research and the individuals whom I've had contact in the US intelligence community, that the US government does indeed have uh, craft that meet the description of many of the UFO reports. The whole aim of the project was to take these craft, or the one in particular that I was working on, and try and duplicate its systems and subsystems with earthly materials. I'm convinced beyond doubt that we have recovered aircraft, alien vehicles, that we have made contact with aliens, that we are communicating with them in some way or form, and that we have vehicles and bodies in preservation. I was uh, at, at that moment standing on the deck of the radar van. It was nighttime, and uh, I was looking up in the sky because there were saucers up there. Were there any alien bodies recovered? No bodies. There were four live, feeling good guys. Four live extraterrestrials? Four live, feeling good, extraterrestrial type individuals, yes. They are here, whoever they are, wherever they came on from, whatever they're doing, um, other intelligences are messing around on our planet. I think that too many people's butts are on the line with this, that they lied to us too long, that, uh, that a lot of people have stolen legitimate national security money to keep this cover-up going, that they have uh, perpetuated disinformation schemes on the American public, probably on the British public. The Air Force knows that there was a crash saucer, there were alien bodies recovered, that there have been aircraft that have gone up to chase UFOs and have not come back. They know that we're dealing with the biggest story of the millennium. Set on a remote dry lake bed 80 miles outside Las Vegas, Area 51 is just one part of the massive Nellis Air Force Base, which is roughly the same size as Switzerland. It was commissioned by President Truman in the 1950s as a top secret location to develop and test America's new generation of post-war aircraft. In the technology fever of the 1950s, the base soon became home to the most exotic flying craft of its day. More recently, it is where the F-117 stealth aircraft was developed and test flown. This is an area that has been known but officially denied for many decades. Uh, uh, we go back uh, quite a ways into the 40s and 50s with the development of the U-2 spy plane, the SR-71. All of our super secret aircraft uh, have been developed and test flown out in this particular area. The A-12 from its inception through its retirement was operated out of only two locations. Uh, Area 51 at Groom Lake was its original home. The first aircraft was delivered there in January of, of 62, and the last airplane left on June 21st, 1968. The U.S. Air Force denies that Area 51 exists, despite footage of the base and Russian satellite photos that we have obtained, which clearly show hangars and a huge runway stretching across the lake bed. In the face of constant denials of its existence, the base has expanded since the 50s, with several passenger jets now landing every day, carrying hundreds of workers to the base. 
With this level of personnel, the few buildings that can be observed above the ground are merely the cover for a large underground facility. Security at the base is unprecedented and secrecy is paramount. Since the late 50s, the military has sequestered hundreds of thousands of acres of land that adjoin the base. The exclusion zone around Area 51 now stretches to 26 miles. The secret status of the base is very, very well preserved. Um, and even if people are talking about the operation of the U-2s back in the 1950s, 40 years ago, uh, they're still not allowed to identify the base um, by, by name or by location. All they can say is it is a remote facility. This place is an old anachronism from the Cold War. Uh, this is a uh, place that, that harkens back to the old days, and, and because the military is continuing to treat it as a, as a top-secret facility that doesn't exist, it attracts attention. At, naturally, everyone wants to know what goes on here. There is no question that the facility is there, that the government has said very little in the past about it, that it has the right to test things like the U-2, like the SR-71, like the stealth aircraft. People forget the stealth aircraft, over $10 million spent on developing it, and more than a decade before its existence was even announced. That's what you do out at Groom Lake. Now, the real question, I suppose, is are there any flying saucers out there? We took to the skies to see the base for ourselves. Flying at an altitude of 10,000 feet, we edged to within one mile of the restricted zone. Having made contact with the tower, we soon found out how seriously Area 51 guards its airspace. We're just curious, is there, is there any activity today out the Groom Lake area? Any activity where, sir? Out at the uh, Groom Lake area. Uh, Lake Mead 6 I don't have any of that information available. Dude, Alpha Control on guard. When working Revly Mole, squawk altitude acknowledged with an ID. The uh, Ellis approach controller now is just getting a little concerned that we're getting close now. We've just been buzzed by two F-16 fighters. They, they passed our bow at about 800 to 1,000 miles an hour. These guys aren't messing around. They don't want us to be here. In fact, there's another one just gone by the bow there. And they're either trying to get us out of the area quickly or force us to land. And there goes another one. Well, that was really close, right off the right side. I'd say that was within a, a mile, mile and a half. Well, you can see them, boy. That, that was amazing. And they have a TCAS on board, so they definitely had radar contact with us. That was really close. In 1989, one man blew the lid of Dreamland. His name was Bob Lazar, and he claimed to have worked at the Groom Lake site, back engineering recovered alien spacecraft. The base is against the side of a, a mountain, or a small mountain, big hill. There are nine hangar doors, and the hangar doors are not just shiny metal out in the desert. They are painted or sprayed with a sand texture to them and from what I can ascertain to prevent satellites from photographing the installation so they look like the mountain range. It was uh, pretty effective from what I can see. Uh, on the first occasion when I drove out there all the hangar doors were closed but at close range you could tell that they were doors and they would open. We drove around the left side of the installation and there was the main entrance in there and went through some gates and a security check and went inside and it seemed like a typical government building. The work that I did basically entailed back engineering the power and propulsion system. And I opted to start with the, uh, the power, the, the reactor that, that ran the craft. With the clearance that I had, that was known as majestic clearance, there were only 22 people at S4 with that clearance to work on the craft. The location he worked on at Area 51 was called S4 
and was housed on Papoose Dry Lake Bed, a short drive from Groom Lake. When I was brought in by bus, normally we had gone around to the left side of the installation and entered the door there. And for the first time, one of the hangar doors, the one on the end, was open. The bus drove up and we stopped there. And clear as day in the hangar, taking up almost all the hangar, was the disc. Uh, looked like something right out of a science fiction movie. And we stopped, got out, and for the first time, I was led in through that door. And as I walked in there, I thought, well, this is the new advanced aircraft we've been working on, and this is why people keep seeing flying saucers, because it's ours, and we've just been testing it probably for all these years. Um, and when I walked alongside it, I ran my hand on it. Uh, I say it, it's metal because it was cold, so I just uh, assume it was uh, some sort of metal. And in fact, by the hatch that was taken off, there was an opening there, and it had a little backwards American flag stuck on it. So I was positive it was something we had manufactured. I was allowed in the craft on one occasion to see the placement of these systems in case it was important to their operation. So I uh, was, of course, escorted in the craft, and um, it was obviously made uh, to be piloted by something smaller than the average human being, uh, very cramped in there. Um, there was a sub-level where a little uh, collapsing floor member opened and I could stick my head in or upper torso down underneath with a flashlight to see how the gravity amplifiers hung upside down. Uh, looked around the placement of the three seats, about one-third to one-fourth the size of a normal human seat. At one point, that one point when I was in the craft, one of the archways became transparent. There were some technicians working on something else that I had no knowledge of. So, and also something began to scroll up on the screen. So it might have been possible that the skin of the craft, whether under, you know, electrical influence or something else, could at times become either transparent to look outside. Um, or be used as some sort of video screen. It was That was pretty amazing. When I went outside and looked at it, it looked as if it was just uh, a plain piece of metal again. A lot of people say, boy, it must have been exciting to go in there, and I, and I always say it, it wasn't. It was a very ominous feeling. It, um, you really had the, uh, because it's so, I know it sounds silly, but it, it, it's so unearthly in there. Nothing had a sharp edge to it. It, it was this, it was if, um, the seats, the amplifiers that were in there, everything as if it was made out of wax and heated for just a little bit and then cooled off. Everything had a smooth curve to it, even where the, a chair met the floor with, was blended into it. It, it. it was if the entire craft was injection molded. No one, let alone Bob Lazar, had been able to verify any of his academic or professional credentials. In 1990, he was convicted of pandering and declared bankrupt. In court, he simply described his occupation as a self-employed photo processor. Is Lazar a fraud? Did he work at S4? Or was he set up by the military to release certain information about the base? The notion that he would make a great patsy and he's the perfect scientist to work on such a project is interesting science fiction. In the first place, we have no reason to say he's a scientist. No diplomas, no papers, no memberships, nothing. In the second place, I worked on security for 14 years. People take security far more seriously than that. One of the strange th statements he's made, there are only 22 people working on this thing. Well, you get more than that working on devising a new mousetrap for the government anyway. That makes no sense. And, you know, it has all the trimmings, his story, of a Walter Mitty story. Somebody in his imagination was, you know, stronger, brighter, faster than anybody else. 
I did uh, a variety of research uh, relative to Bob Lazar. I actually met him. Uh, I obtained a copy of his, uh, what they call a W-2 form, which is one of the IRS documents associated with, uh, with pay. Uh, his particular form indicated that he worked for the U.S. Department of Naval Intelligence. Uh, my investigation of this document and the claims that uh, Bob Lazar made uh, followed uh, a, a very strict path of uh, sound research. I contacted the U.S. Department of Naval Intelligence and indeed uh, verified that uh, they were likely responsible for presenting that W-2. I investigated uh, the issue with the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, they informed me the exact words were, uh, it appears to be legit, and that it was a genuine document. It was not something that had been fabricated. There were a variety of numbers, uh, contract numbers and so forth, uh, issued on the document, which I was able to research. Again, finding that these were highly classified uh, numbers. In fact, uh, Internal Revenue Service ran into a, a brick wall when it came to trying to track down uh, the actual employer associated with the, with the document. He gave me uh, uh, information about his background, educational background and employment background. I started with, uh, with his claim to have worked at Los Alamos Lab. I figured, well, that's a good starting point. If he worked at Los Alamos, it's pretty likely that he had an education somewhere. They don't just hire people off the street. And if he worked at Los Alamos, especially on classified projects, it's at least reasonable to assume he could have been hired somewhere else in Nevada to work on similar projects. We went to Los Alamos and uh, got nothing uh, even close to cooperation. Uh, they wouldn't uh, respond to our phone calls. They say we have no information on Bob Lazar. There's nothing in the files. I said, are you sure now? No, nothing in the files. I showed him uh, the, f the phone book entry that Bob had kept that said uh, he was there. I showed him the newspaper article that, that showed that he was there. Are you certain uh, that you don't have a Bob Lazar? Well, Maybe we had a Bob Lazar. Here's an ID number, but he didn't work for us. He worked for someone else. Basically, uh, Los Alamos Lab um, tried to thwart me at every step. We're completely uncooperative in trying to get information about Bob, and I, and I found that to be the case at every step of the way in trying to verify his background. I'm the one that couldn't find any records or anything. I mean, I'm the one that brought that up to say was the first one to run into that. Initially I couldn't find, couldn't get a hold of my birth certificate either and that was one of the things that concerned me is uh, they might be trying to make me essentially a non-person. I think it's most likely that uh, Bob Lazar was indeed set up to be the conduit for certain information relating to this extraterrestrial project. On one occasion in the desert Bob Lazar saw a flying disc being tested. I was brought into the hangar for one of the short duration tests and the craft was already outside on the lake bed and lifts it off silently and was drifted around for a bit and set back down and that was uh, pretty much of a marvelous sight. It's a huge thing. It, uh, it's like seeing a house lift off the ground quietly. It's just you, you can't imagine the energy involved to do that and not to make any noise at all. There was some audio communication with the craft and so I, I can only assume that there were humans in board and somehow they had managed to squeeze themselves into those little seats or put something in there to sit on and obviously they knew how to operate whatever controls there was or fabricate their own or retrofit it with something. The Apollo space missions of the 1960s stirred America into space fever. But as the country's finest astronauts hurtled skywards in conventional rockets, did the president know of the existence of sources and propulsion systems that were literally out of this world? Dr. Edgar Mitchell of the Apollo 14 mission and the sixth man to walk on the moon has carried out extensive investigations of the alleged saucer crashes as well as the question of alien contact. He met Lazar in 1991. I tend to believe that his basic story is true, that he was too exposed to uh, what he thought were alien craft, 
and attempts to engineer and back engineer. I think that his explanation of what's going on and his theory that he's utilizing is probably not on target. What I think is credible is the fact that he was there. Since the Roswell incident in 1947, uh, that there was a cover-up, that that was a valid incident, and that there has been an active uh, investigation program, reverse engineering program, and cover-up associated with that since that time. After working at S4 for several months, and in clear violation of his top secret clearance, Bob Lazar decided to tell his closest friend, Gene Huff, about his work at the base. My reaction was to, without pressing him against his will, find out more, get him to tell me anything I could. And um, it wasn't disbelief. Uh, I, I think I was actually motivated to further read. I started investigate, investigating other books on UFOs and other researchers' information to see if anyone knew anything, and needless to say, they didn't know what Bob knew. One month later, in March 1989, Bob Lazar went one step further. He decided to take his friends to the desert and show them a flying disc test. I had remembered most of the days and times of testing. So I believe it was 8 or 9 o'clock on a Wednesday night, somewhere in March 89, I believe. We went out with Gene Huff, my ex-wife, and uh, John Lear. Shortly after the flight time that I had recorded, um, white light uh, came up off the ground and hovered, and then be doing, uh, began doing radical step maneuvers and darting from one side of the sky to the other, doing some impossible flight characteristics. But at times the craft had you know, glowed tremendously bright where we thought, and being miles and miles away, we thought there was something wrong and the craft was going to explode so much so that we all got behind the car. It actually came closer. It came down the mountain range toward us to where we could actually see it was elliptically shaped. Uh, it looked like something that... Eh, it's, it's strange to explain. It looks like an explosion that starts to explode and stops and doesn't explode and dissipate. That's how bright the light is. Your brain interprets it as an explosion about to happen. On his third visit with his friends to observe the discs at night, Bob Lazar was arrested. He was taken to an unknown location for interrogation and never returned to Area 51. They threatened my wife, they threatened to kill my wife, they said they'd stop at nothing. They said they thought they made that very clear, they couldn't believe that I had taken anyone out there to show them that, much less left with information like the uh, flight test data, and uh, wanted to know what else I had said, who else I had told specifically. Security agents from the OFI, the Office of Federal Investigation, had been witnessed doing random security checks at his house. Uh, there was almost no question in anyone's mind, anyone in, in Bob's immediate life who, who talked with him on the telephone that his phone was tapped. I mean, strange things would happen on Bob's phone and really continue to this day. Dennis Mariani, who was my supervisor, called and you know, all he said was, do you have any idea what we're going to do to you now? And that was the end of the phone call. They were, uh, they were crazy. They really were. They were completely out of control. When you go to work out at those locations, you sign away your constitutional rights. You sign a piece of paper saying that if you violate your security agreement and you discuss programs that you're working on without a trial, without right of appeal, you're going to go to Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary for 20 years. That's a real big incentive to keep your mouth shut. We had an engineer who worked at this TV station who, before he was here, had worked at Area 51 and had seen one of these craft under a tarp walked into a place he probably shouldn't have been. I arranged to do an interview with him. He lives in another city, in another state. He agreed reluctantly as long as I would block out his face. Well, we make the arrangements on the phone. The interview is supposed to happen the next day. He gets up, goes to work. There are two men in a car outside of his house talking into a radio. They follow him to work. When he gets out of work, they follow him home. No interview. 
I mean, it happened again and again and again. Same scenario. It has been very difficult to talk about this. It's almost like uh, every time I relate the story, it gets a little easier. But when I first started talking about it, it was like my mouth didn't even want to form the words and the sound didn't even want to come out of my throat. Uh, so I can only guess from that that there is a very strong uh, suggestion given to me not to talk about this, not to remember it, and if I did remember it, not to ever talk about it to anyone. This man is a 71-year-old mechanical engineer who, like Bob Lazar, claims to have worked at Area 51. He started working there in the 1950s on a flying disc simulator built to train US pilots. He said he's been given permission to talk to us about certain specific aspects of his work, but asked us not to reveal his identity. We received the disc. And then several months later, they were taken to the Nevada, Nevada site. One of the things I worked on was a, a flying disc simulator to train pilots to, uh, to fly this strange, uh, strange looking craft designed for humans to fly, uh, not for any extraterrestrial to fly. His most fantastical claim was that he worked at Area 51 with an alien codenamed J-Rod for 16 years on this simulator project. J-Rod is a gray alien, about five foot four. His role was only as a, as a, as a translator, scientific translator, that was all. If we wanted to put something in the place of what they had, he had to agree with it. I would have a question, uh, you know, and, and I would bring it up in my mind, I just how I wanted to present it with him, and he'd already know that I had this question, and he would already have the answer for me. And if he responded, it would be in my voice. And you wouldn't even open your lips. It is possible that he and uh, a few thousand others are working on a project, either here or elsewhere. Is this a few thousand other greys? few thousand other graves like himself. The nearest town to Area 51 is Rachel, population 150, and home to the most famous bar and grill in Nevada, the Little Alien. The local residents have seen their highway truck stop turned into the UFO and ET center of America. Tourists flock to Rachel to scan the skies in the hope of having a sighting. For all the hype, the sightings of bizarre lights in the sky do continue. Local resident Chuck Clark has had many unexplainable sightings. The most uh, remarkable sighting that I've had in the last three years took place uh, two years ago, February, February of 93. Uh, I watched uh, a glowing object ascend vertically uh, from the area south of Area 51 where S4 would be located. Uh, hang motionless in the air for about 10 minutes and then slowly start to descend. All of this while I thought I was watching a illumination flare that was launched from a mortar tube. I can hear jets in the background. I'll zoom back a little bit. This is looking straight over Steve Medlin's ranch. This is right over the peaks. Once it got down to the ridge line, however, uh, it was in front of the hill that had, cut, that had come up from behind. The hill was about 12 and a half miles from my position. Uh, it came down to a few feet above the ground at the base of the hill, hovered momentarily, which is still consistent with what a flare might do in calm air, but then suddenly it shot off westward, covered 4.8 miles in one to one and a half seconds, and stopped 
cold, also about 30 feet off the ground, hovered just long enough for me to get it focused in my binoculars for maybe two seconds, and then it vanished right in place. We've seen video of craft that were uh, luminous that would move across the sky as if it was uh, skipping a stone across water or, or sort of a sewing machine effect. What we see across the screen are a series of uh, lights, of dashes of light uh, as the object moves from point A to point B and uh, a rather strange warping occurs that's very difficult to unravel until you go frame by frame and you begin to see what is actually occurring. Uh, therefore, we are seeing uh, what you might call a shadow effect of the propulsion mechanism at work. I've spoken to several people who've seen UFOs or disc-shaped craft out there. Uh, an attorney who lives here in town who has seen one. He saw, saw one land outside the boundaries of Area 51. I've spoken to a very high-level managerial type who worked for a defense contractor out there for a number of years from a very respectable, uh, reputable family. His credentials are beyond question, but he doesn't want his name or face used, and he has seen them many times. There were a variety uh, of craft that were all essentially generically uh, sort of canister shaped. I guess you would say they were predominantly disc shaped or rounded like a, uh, one of those uh, Chinese lanterns or something or other. They appear to be colorful. Uh, at least uh, they were multicolored uh, in addition to the lights that seemed to be able to uh, take on uh, the light of the background. They, they, they could camouflage themselves somewhat in the sky by absorbing the, the blue light from the sky and the clouds. What are these lights in the sky? And are they indeed flying saucers? We asked U.S. Navy physicist and UFO expert Dr. Bruce Maccabee to examine the footage. Basically what you see are lights, lighted objects, doing things way off in the distance. You don't really see any structured craft. Uh, some of the video material, a very small amount that I've seen, seems to show lights doing strange things like hovering and then moving suddenly to another location, maybe and moving slowly and jumping around a little bit. I've concluded that they aren't ours. That means they belong to somebody else, and you know, they're not made here on Earth, basically, so they must be coming from the outside. How they get here, you know, who, in quotes, they belong to, I don't know. You know extraterrestrials is a reasonable proposal. Uh, all the arguments that have been put forth that it couldn't be people from another star system in the galaxy or whatever, because they can't get here from there, those arguments are not physically correct, because we could get there given enough time and money uh, and desire to do it. However, it's clear that uh, these other intelligences, whatever they are, are far beyond us in terms of technology. Now what I'm going to show you is a computer enhanced version of what you just saw. And we're just going to look at the one portion where the UFO was appearing in the left hand corner, going to the right, and then coming back again. That's all we're going to see. We're going to see it repeated over and over again. This part of the frame has been chopped out of the full frame. So I'll just let it run, and it goes back and forth and back and forth repeating. Mm. And if we stop it, and here's the shadow, and here's the UFO. So basically, we have a triangle with one side and two angles that we know. The net result is I can calculate the UFO position in three-dimensional space. Right. turns out to be about 7,000 feet away from the camera. So having analyzed it, what we seem to have here, Bruce, is a genuine UFO. Yes, there is an object out there 7,000 feet away. It wasn't one of ours. It's about 30 feet in size. A genuine UFO. Security at Area 51 is formidable. The entire perimeter is surrounded by motion detectors and cameras. Armed guards patrol in jeeps and helicopter gunships are deployed to warn off anyone who challenges the borders. 
we headed out deep into the desert, over 80 miles outside Las Vegas. Traveling down the recently renamed extraterrestrial highway, we'd come to see America's most secret base for ourselves. The only approach to the base is a dusty 10-mile track called Groom Lake Road. Anyone approaching the border can clearly be seen for miles, and as we've been warned, our every move was being monitored by the security patrols and cameras on the hilltops. This is as far as you can come to go to the Groom Lake base. It actually says on these signs that use of deadly force is authorized. There are security patrols all over these hills. They've been watching us for the best part of the last hour. There are motion sensors, security cameras. And if I did walk over this line, I'd be immediately arrested, taken to the guardhouse, and interrogated for anything up to a week. As soon as you step over the line, past this sign, you lose all rights. What's amazing to me, Glenn, is that the entrance here is so unassuming. They've got this rickety sign saying use of deadly force authorized. But you literally could, you know, if you didn't know what you were doing, you'd just carry on straight into the base. That's the idea. You don't encounter any people here. If you went into the guardhouse that's there about a quarter mile in, you'd be arrested immediately because you've already passed those signs. They don't want to answer any questions, so they don't put any people in vulner vulnerable positions. And as you come off the highway up there, the extraterrestrial highway, there's no sign saying Groom Lake. There's nothing, is there? No, I put up a secret base sign up there occasionally, secret base this way, but it doesn't stay up for very long. And on foot or in car, this is as close as you can get to, to Groom Lake, isn't it? This is physically as close as you can get. Unfortunately, you can't see anything from here at all. How far are we actually away from, from the base? We're about uh, 13 miles uh, north northeast of the base right now. Right. And if we continued up this road, if we drove into the base now past the signs, we'd be arrested. If you dro drove beyond here 20 feet, you'd be intercepted. As night fell and determined to see the secret facility, we headed for Tikaboo Peak, which overlooks the base 7,000 feet above the desert. At our base camp, I talked to Glenn Campbell, who founded the Area 51 Research Center in Rachel, and who produces the Groom Lake Desert Rat newsletter. He gave up a successful career in computers to devote his life to uncovering the truths of Dreamland. This is a large facility as big as the state of Connecticut. It's uh, got lots of unknown, unexplored areas that you could store anything you want. Um, Area 51 is only the best known secret base of a vast complex that could house a, a, a lot of different things we don't know about. But there's actually no fencing, is there? Yet they know when you cross that line. It's simply marked by orange posts every few hundred feet. Uh, a, it's easy to wander across this line, but as soon as you do, they're going to detect you and they'll be right on you. Uh, this is a very harsh military border. It's not a place for tourists. They have, military has never said there are no UFOs. It's never directly denied any of the Area 51 stories. It would have been so simple when these claims came out, these Papoose Lake claims, for the military to simply say, look, we have nothing there. They could take a few reporters to this area and show them nothing there. The military hasn't done it. The military has stonewalled. It has remained silent. And that's the most damning thing that they can do. At 3 a.m. we started our final ascent of Tikaboo. We needed to reach the summit before daybreak in order to see the base lit up for its nighttime test flights. Even at night, the roar of the jet shattered the silence of the desert. As we reached the summit under a cloak of darkness, Area 51 could clearly be seen its runway lights glowing in the distance. After trekking for several hours, we finally set up camp here some 7,000 feet up. And since the crack of dawn, we've been watching non-existent flights ferrying non-existent personnel to this non-existent base. Tikaboo Peak is the last safe vantage point where you can clearly see Dreamland. But how long before this too is claimed by the military?
The Groom Lake mystery continues. We followed the personnel flights out of the secret base and they've landed here at McCarran Airport just outside Las Vegas. There are apparently over a dozen flights every day ferrying the personnel in and out of America's most secret base. I was called at a random time. The operator would say, Mr. Lazar, it's now 4.15 a.m. We expect you to be at McCarran Airport at 4.45. Your plane will be leaving at such and such time. I'd drive there, check in, board the plane, and the plane would fly out to Groom Lake. As the Groom Lake workers headed off in their cars, we tried to enter the terminal. Who could you point me to at the base who could give me some information? Okay, what I want to tell you right now, you're trespassing on private property. Sorry, who thought that was the point? <laughs> you're trespassing on private property. You're inside our gate. And I'm going to advise you right now to leave the premises immediately. Okay? Is this government? You're to do that immediately. This is private property. You're trespassing. Leave the premises. As soon as I get to get the information. Is it, is it government property or is it just private? No comment. You're trespassing. Okay. Are you trying to kid, bud? Is there anyone you can point us to to give us any details of that? As we were ejected from the airport, yet another Janet flight left for Groom Lake. Our investigations have revealed that a private company is working with the US military at Area 51. We believe this is the company, EG&G Special Projects. It's worked for the last 50 years on top secret and sensitive projects with the US government, and it's said to control the Janet flights that take the workers to the base, as well as all the security and technical support for the back engineering of alien spacecraft. I did not work for EG&G directly. I was just interviewed in one of their facilities at McCarran Airport. So a short time later, I was called back in for this new job at S4. And they had explained to me that it dealt with some sort of field propulsion system. And I was just under the assumption that this is an advanced type of aircraft that's being worked on. And uh, I was excited about the position. Definitely the private property. OK. So they actually cut your camera off and please leave. Does it have any connection with the Groom Lake base? I'm, to actually, I'm, just, I'm actually to leave the property. Does this company have any connection with the flights that leave McCarran? EG&G has been the central civilian contractor for Groom Lake basically since the beginning. Uh, they're the people who military folks come and go, uh, other contractors come and go. EG&G has had the contract since the very beginning. So if anyone were to know what's going on out there, it'd be EG&G. They're not talking. We phoned EG&G to clarify what their role is at the base, but they would only confirm that the company is working on several classified Department of Defense contracts at various remote locations in Nevada. They would not comment on the exact nature of the work, but did state that it was connected with EMP, electromagnetic propulsion. If recovered alien craft are buried deep beneath the Nevada desert, then the power to release this information to the public lies deep inside the corridors of Washington. As an intelligence insider said to me, the problem isn't obtaining the information, it's handling the truth. Are these alien craft above Groom Lake, or are they man-made? Have the U.S. military developed the technology to build flying disks? There's uh, a great deal of legitimacy to this uh, UFO phenomenon, to the issue of alien intelligence. This is something that's not at all new to the U.S. military. There's programs that they're working on today that are 50 years ahead of anything that you and I could even conceive of. The black project teams are operating without oversight from 
official committees from Congress, if you will. I find that exceedingly distressing, frightening, the ultimate big brother scenario. Everything is being run by the ETs. They're so far beyond us in terms of technology that uh, I don't think we would have a chance. I don't think we've yet scratched the surface on what's happening out there with regard to flying saucers. There are a variety of activities, some of which are classified throughout what is often called the Air Force's Nellis Range Complex. The range is used for the testing of technologies and systems and training for operations critical to the effectiveness of U.S. military forces and the security of the United States. There is an operating location near Groom Dry Lake. Some specific activities and operations conducted on the Nellis Range, both past and present, remain classified and cannot be discussed. Based on the evidence of former workers and the unexplainable lights in the sky, there is little doubt that Area 51, seen here in the distance, does house flying craft that are literally out of this world. If recovered alien spacecraft and bodies have been taken to this remote location since the 1950s, could a secret of this size be kept under wraps for so long? And if so, who's keeping it? We're dealing with a cosmic water gate. That means that some few people within the governments of the United States, Canada, Britain, and undoubtedly other countries have known since July 1947 when at least two crashed flying saucers and several alien bodies were recovered in New Mexico, that indeed some UFOs are extraterrestrial spacecraft. Since Project Blue Book closed down in 1969, there was no official interest in this subject. That seemed, to say the least, a trifle strange when documents that have come out under the Freedom of Information Act in America uh, show the contrary, show that uh, organizations like the CIA and the NSA are actually very heavily involved in UFO research. There's a relatively small number of people within the intelligence, military intelligence and scientific and technical intelligence community who are aware of what's going on. And an even smaller group who are actually organizing top secret research into this phenomenon. Whenever we'd have a crash, the staff people would tell the public information officer, use a story number 38 in the book and he would, he would release details according to a standard release procedure for that kind of a story and they never told the truth because that was always just classified information. The uh, government is fighting tooth and nail it will not reveal any kind of information about that base and as a result workers people who helped win the Cold War who dedicated their lives to these secret programs who kept their mouths shut for all these years are dying because of exposure to toxic materials that the government refuses to acknowledge exist out there because they refuse to acknowledge the base itself. If it is already explained, there's nothing exciting, why can't people talk about it? Presenting Cosmic Journey. One of the most revealing glimpses of just what the Pentagon knew about the existence of crash sources and alien contact came in 1989 with the development of a top secret project codenamed Cosmic Journey. Cosmic Journey is a new experience in live entertainment, a new concept and a new dimension. This is something that no one should miss and I guarantee you that millions and millions of people throughout the world will remember this for the rest of their life. Its aim was to display to the public, by way of a travelling exhibition, the crashed craft and preserved alien bodies that the government had in its possession. The Pentagon enlisted the help of Bob Exler, a NASA mission specialist in robotics, who was also a respected UFO researcher. At a series of meetings in Washington in 1989, military officials set out their plans to Exler. They were devising a variety of kiosks to show the history of the UFO sightings, uh, UFOs associated with the space program, and of course aliens uh, associated commonly with uh, the abduction phenomena. I was shown a 
photographic rendition that involved uh, an actual, what appeared to be some form of an alien creature, uh, typical to the uh, gray aliens that have been referred to popularly in the publications and the press. Uh, the creature was encased in uh, sort of a glass coffin-like structure that uh, uh, was being preserved. There was a lot of apparatus, uh, tanks and so forth, uh, probably some form of a cryogenic tank uh, to preserve the, uh, the body from decay. As part of his indoctrination program, Exler was flown out to an offshore NORAD tracking facility. Traveling in unmarked black helicopters, they headed out 20 miles off the coast of Florida, landing on what looked like an oil rig. As we got into this facility, we descended to uh, an area that I would describe as sort of a mezzanine area uh, looking out over a control room. This was obviously a, a, a NORAD tracking facility. Uh, there was a huge um, screen. It uh, represented an area of the uh, southeast quadrant of the United States. Then there were a series of uh, lights that were floating along sort of like the top of this uh, grid area. Uh, there were five of them in all. They were labeled, by the way, um, on the screen as ASCs, and I heard someone uh, make reference to alternative spacecraft. The craft went down into this grid, uh, into this vortex area, and then dispersed. And no one seemed to be concerned at all. Presenting Cosmic Journey, an experiential entertainment concept of Kenneth Fell Productions. Cosmic I've Journey not is... since been contacted by anyone associated with the Cosmic Journey. Uh, there have been, since the publication of the book uh, revealing the, uh, the project itself, there have been a number of plausible denials by uh, members associated with the project and of course uh, categorical denials on uh, anything related to the uh, more intrinsic alien issues. The only official UFO investigation that the United States will admit to was Project Blue Book. It was set up by President Truman in 1952 after a rash of UFO sightings over sensitive military areas. Was it a genuine attempt to investigate UFOs, or just a smokescreen to keep an increasingly anxious Congress and public at bay? The public was told everything's under control. Sign, grudge, blue book, that is the organization that's doing the UFO thing. We have access to the finest scientists. There was a whole bunch of malarkey that went along with that. It was set up as a public information office to answer the questions on the UFO phenomena for the public. And their case information, their files, were sent down from upstairs, from where my office was, where my desk was. Usually cases that could be explained away, and those were used as sample cases in dealing with the public. The Anything classified above confidential stayed upstairs and even went higher and never got into the, came into the purview of Blue Book at all. I don't think it was a genuine investigation in that the really sensitive reports were filtered out by a more important group than Project Blue Book. We have obtained copies of Project Blue Book documents. There are literally hundreds of reports of UFO sightings and eyewitness accounts from both civilians and military personnel, many that were unexplainable. Project Blue Book is still some 40 years later the most important body of evidence admitted by the US authorities that we have made contact with extraterrestrials. The investigation was closed down suddenly in 1969. No reason was given. Blue Book was the cover organization. That's the one you heard about. That's the only one ever mentioned and as recently as last year, an Air Force letter to a senator said Blue Book was it, and when we closed it, we got out of the business. In reality, all these other groups concerned with monitoring the skies were continuing to look at militarily important cases. A light in the sky means nothing, but if one goes buzzing down the runway, 
at a strategic air command base where nuclear weapons are stored, which has happened, and we've got some records on that, that's of concern. We can say that the recent sightings are in no way connected with any secret development by any agency of the United States. You can go and look through the Project Blue Book records and find numerous sightings which have been, quote, explained. And you go and look at the explanation and you find the explanation does not fit the description by the witness or witnesses. That's evidence that the Air Force was trying to get rid of the problem by explaining it away at all costs. The evidence seems to suggest that the United States government is still investigating UFOs. The question is, who's in charge? Both the NSA, FBI and the CIA deny any responsibility. Because all information regarding extraterrestrials is handled as SCI, sensitive compartmentalized information, even the President of the United States in the White House behind me may not know the whole story. Who's in charge? Is it the President? Is it the Air Force? I'm convinced that we still have an analog with Majestic 12. A group of outstanding people, intelligence community primarily, and some technological people are running the show. Presidents come and go, the intelligence agencies go on forever. To the best of my knowledge, there is no official UFO investigation unit operated by the United States government. However, unofficially, the records show that the Defense Intelligence Agency, through its defense attache system, has a remit to report on UFO incidents worldwide, and that's easily provable, despite the fact that the DIA maintains they have no interest at all in the subject. I tried during my three-year tour of duty to establish contact with an opposite number in the United States. I made repeated attempts to do that, but consistently drew a blank. I was told that since Project Blue Book closed down in 1969, there was no official interest in this subject. I didn't work for the US government. I worked for a satellite government of this country. As far as the Senate concerned, uh, I think there was only one left, and that was Bob Dole. And as far as the presidents are concerned, the only presidents that I feel that I met at the facilities back in the 50s and 60s were Nixon and Bush. We contacted former President George Bush to ask him what he knew about the existence of recovered alien craft and the developments out at Area 51. We received a fax response. Unfortunately, we are not able to provide answers to the questions that you send. President Bush's policy of long-standing is not to comment on or engage in speculation about alleged classified programs of any kind. A close confidant of George Bush and a man well acquainted with Area 51 was Admiral Bob Inman. His credentials are impeccable. He was director of both Naval Intelligence and the National Security Agency, as well as deputy director of the Defense Intelligence Agency and the CIA. In a telephone conversation with Bob Exler in 1989, he referred to recovered vehicles becoming available for research. Do, do you uh, anticipate that any of the recovered vehicles would ever be uh, become available for uh technological research outside of the uh, military circles? Again, I honestly don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, ten years ago, the answer would have been no. Yeah. Uh, whether as time has evolved, they're beginning to become more open on it, is a possibility. He knew from an official standpoint uh, that uh, these vehicles, these objects existed, that they were in military, U.S. military custody, and that uh, there were scientific projects associated with those. I believe it is the first uh, revelation by anyone in a high enough uh, level capacity within the U.S. government, especially within the intelligence community, to in effect acknowledge 
that uh, we are indeed involved, that UFOs are real, that uh, they were developed by non-human intelligence, and that uh, somehow or another we have acquired possession of that technology. Inman does not say much. There is no reference, there's no mention of UFOs, spacecraft, anything like that. The conversation centers on recovered vehicles, technology, and so forth. But um, Admiral Inman was aware of the subject matter. And we know from his executive assistant, Tom King, that there was to be no public discussion of these matters, the matters that had been discussed between Exler and Inman because of national secrecy laws. He that you not quote him or use his name uh, in any manner without his prior approval. Inman retired from government service in 1982 to become president of Science Applications International Corporation of San Diego. Interestingly, one of the company's primary areas of research is into gravitational propulsion systems, the same method of propulsion of flying disks that Bob Lazar worked on at Area 51. Jane's Defense Weekly, uh, the popular military and defense publication, uh, published an article about SAIC and the postscript to the article that anyone who believes in the science of anti-gravity to be too arcane, too esoteric, even for the U.S. Air Force, should consider the electric propulsion study undertaken by SAIC for the Astronautics Laboratory, which is now part of the Phillips Lab. The study's primary objective was to outline physical methods to test theories of inductive coupling between electromagnetic and gravitational forces to determine the feasibility of such methods as they apply to space propulsion, and in simplified terms, an anti-gravity propulsion system. It remains for some the ultimate quantum leap. Well, it's possible, one, because I saw the equipment that would do it, and two, it is theory that would work. Gravity distorts time, and like I said, that's not a theory. We know that to be true. And if you're bending space and time along with it, when you wind back up in that place, you're there between the ticks of a clock. We called Admiral Inman to find out what he knows about Area 51 and why his company is developing this gravity propulsion system. Let me get right to the point that you're after. Yep. I had occasion in several different jobs to ask the question, was there any credible evidence? Uh, when I was the vice director at the Defense Intelligence Agency, the National Security Agency, the Central Intelligence Agency, I inquired at each of the three places uh, at different times, do you have any credible evidence that would support the existence of UFO or, you know, alien? Yeah. And the answer was always no. Jane's wrote an article in which it mentioned Science Applications International, um, and it referred to some of the development it was working on as the ultimate quantum leap, exotic, shall we say, gravity propulsion systems. What exactly are those, and what, what are, they, are they used for flying craft? I'm pausing because I want to make sure I don't overstate the case. Right. We're on a little sensitive ground here. There have been over the years, uh, I thought, some of the early uh, allegations of activity out in Nevada 15 years ago. Uh, could well have been reflection of the prototype testing of some of the stealth vehicles. Some are clearly scientific phenomena. Some of it, again, will be so, something as simple as weather balloons right. that break loose, that get lost and go drifting. But there probably is some of it that is directly related to testing of late 20th century, early 21st century military technology related partly to reconnaissance in some cases and others to, you know, attack aircraft. This 
is the Nellis Air Force Base, one of the top military installations in America. It's split into four main areas. The Tonopah and Nevada test sites, where America's top secret nuclear tests take place, as well as the Nellis bombing range, where the latest jets and bombers are put through their paces. It's also home to Area 51, so if there are flying saucers being tested over the desert, then the personnel at Nellis definitely know about it. We were contacted by a former radar operator at Nellis, who confirmed that she had witnessed a classified flying disc test out in the test range. She left the Air Force in 1985 and is too frightened to reveal her true identity. The flying disc test took place at night in the desert a few miles from the base. I was uh, at, at that moment standing on the deck of the radar van. It was nighttime and uh, I was looking up in the sky because there were saucers up there. Um, there were 10 to 15 saucers and they were glowing orange on the bottom, the one that was closest to me. I could see in pretty good detail. I was standing with a group of people of whom I did not know any of them and they did not appear to know each other. So it seemed like we were all very isolated. Uh, no one was talking to anyone. Uh, it was very frightening because what, you're, what I was seeing was definitely something uh, that was very highly classified and uh, there was a couple of people talking inside the radar van who I assumed were officers but no one was wearing any rank insignia and no one was wearing any name tags. The maneuvers that they executed were very sophisticated um, so my guess is that they were being piloted by aliens who knew exactly what maneuvers they could do. As part of the test, she was taken to what she believes was Area 51. We were taken to a medical facility that was uh, very sophisticated. Someone came and took me into uh, an examining room and they had me lay down on a, a stainless steel table. And someone came in through the door, walked around the table up beside the right side of my head, saying in a real deadpan monotone voice, stay calm stay calm, stay calm. When he got up by the side of my head, he had had a hypodermic needle hidden in his hand. He brought it up and it went straight into my, the right side of my neck and whatever chemical it was went straight to the brain. It has taken her over 10 years to come forward with this information. It has been very difficult to talk about this. It's almost like uh, every time I relate the story, it gets a little easier, but when I first started talking about it, it was like my mouth didn't even want to form the words, and the sound didn't even want to come out of my throat. Uh, so I can only guess from that that there was a very strong suggestion given to me not to talk about this, not to remember it, and if I did remember it, not to ever talk about it to anyone. As recently as 10 years ago, this Lockheed A-12, which flew out of Groom Lake, was still one of the U.S. Air Force's most top-secret military aircraft. If you'd seen it in the skies at night, you may be forgiven for thinking you'd just seen a UFO. So how many of the hundreds of thousands of UFO sightings every year are nothing more than military aircraft? And is the great secret of Groom Lake just a 21st century descendant of this airplane? The original test pilot was Lou Shock. The first time he saw it, I mean, he, he rubbed his eyes, he turned around, walked back out of the production hangar at Lockheed and walked back in because he did not believe his eyes. You know, initially they were going to call it El Salvador instead of Cygnus uh, for the simple reason in Spanish uh, that means the Savior or Jesus Christ. Like everybody, everybody who saw the airplane could not believe what they were seeing. It was a Buck Rogers airplane. This airplane was built, designed, almost 40 years ago. 40 years before that, the hottest thing flying was a Seversky P-35. 40 years before that, it was a balloon. 
So the technology, technology has not stood still. So it's a very good possibility that we are looking at man-made transportation for the 21st century. The United States Air Force alone um, in 1997, according to the latest budget request, will spend more than $11 billion on research, development, and production of secret weapon systems of one kind or another. That's considerably more than the entire research and production expenditure of any other military in the world. I am very distressed that the black project teams are operating without oversight from official committees, from Congress, if you will, from public oversight, with black budgets that no one knows where it's going or what it's being used for. Uh, I find that exceedingly distressing, frightening, the ultimate big brother scenario. I think the, a good part of the reason for keeping everything classified is because this is an awesome weapon. Now you think uh, the amount of energy that this system can put out, weapon system if you want to look at it as that, and it obviously had some weapon potential. Just think about being able to deploy something like that virtually instantaneously anywhere in the world. Uh, you know, you have a conflict in the Middle East, how long does it take you to get an aircraft carry over there? Well, it takes a long time. Here's an awesome weapon power that flies, that can move somewhere virtually instantaneously and, you know, pound an enemy virtually into dust. Um, yeah, that's something to keep awfully secret at, you know, at any price, because that's something you can almost conquer the entire planet with. I'm convinced that human beings are building uh, disc-shaped craft. In fact, it was reported uh, that by 1960, the U.S. military had already developed a disc that could operate uh, silently. Man-made flying saucers are indeed real. This is the Avro car, which was launched in total secrecy in 1955, less than 10 years after alien saucers were allegedly recovered from Roswell, New Mexico. A CIA memorandum in 1955 stated that the Avro car was based on research developed by German scientists in World War II. We have obtained the only film ever taken of the first top secret test flights in Canada in 1960. Why was the military test flying saucer shaped flying craft in the 1950s when Project Blue Book denied they existed? Was it a cover to hide the real alien saucers being tested out at Area 51? Like Project Blue Book, the Avro car was scrapped suddenly in the late 60s after millions of dollars were spent. No reason was given. More recently, the Lockheed Skunk Works in Palmdale, California, unveiled Project Dark Star, an unmanned aerial reconnaissance vehicle. Seen in hangars or in the skies, it is a UFO. I think it's time that you get a look at the newest star in the world of airborne reconnaissance. Ladies and gentlemen, I present Dark Star. Dark Star is a very unusual looking aircraft. It has a saucer shaped body and a pair of very long slender wings attached to the back. Like many stealth aircraft, including the B-2, its appearance varies drastically according to what angle you see it from. If, for example, you see the aircraft kind of edgeways on, you might well think that this was something totally foreign, totally unlike any conventional aircraft, and certainly much more like what people have described as flying saucers. I think it's quite possible that some of the things that are being developed in the United States today are of such a revolutionary nature uh, and still very secret that when they are seen from time to time as things inevitably do get seen when they're tested that they could be mistaken for what people think are, are UFOs. At any given time of course the technology that we have is five or ten years more advanced than the technology that is on public display but these sorts of things do not fly over the heads of bewildered uh, members of the public. They fly exclusively in uh, 
very clearly defined ranges and danger areas. So the sorts of things that are being reported as UFOs will not be ours. In September of 1947, the Air Force wrote to J. Edgar Hoover a letter saying we checked all of our research projects, etc. You know, it would be not just the Air Force, but the Navy and the Army, everybody. And we have nothing that could create these flying disc sightings. A big UFO convention came to an end in Las Vegas last night, and afterwards, naturally, some of the members went out in the desert to search for UFOs. A news crew went along, too, and sure enough, it wasn't long before a mysterious, unidentified object appeared. Not too surprising, somewhere up there, you see it, because this patch of desert is right near a military test site. This looked like no aircraft lights that any of these folks had ever seen. Was it a bird? Was it a plane? Was it the aurora, the secret plane? We don't know. More to come, I'm sure, and the Air Force is not saying anything as usual. If UFOs are man-made craft, how do you explain the tens of thousands of cases of reported alien abductions every year? In 1975, seven loggers were heading home after a day in the forest to Sholo, Arizona, and came across a bright light in the trees in the distance. Driving closer, they could clearly make out the shape of a flying saucer, which was lighting up the forest around them. Mike Rogers and Travis Walton were in the truck. It uh, had lighted spots on it and, and was basically metallic, had a metallic framework. Uh, my first feeling was that it looked rather beautiful, uh, but at that time it wasn't making any noise and it wasn't moving, it was just quietly perched there in the air. When it started to move, the sound got real powerful, and I, I jumped for cover, and I got down behind this log, and the guys were yelling, get away from there, and they were swearing and everything, and I was getting, you know, pretty scared myself, and I made up my mind to make a run for it, and when I raised up, wham, something hit me. A beam of energy, a bolt of lightning, but it wasn't like lightning, it was like straight sided, like a, like a deliberate beam of energy, but it was so powerful it created like an explosion that lifted him off his feet and blew him backwards. And here's Travis flying back through the air. Uh, just He landed some distance from where he'd been standing, landed flat on his back. And as he's going through the air, his arms outstretched. He, he looked lifeless at the time, like the concussion of it had already killed him or knocked him out or something. Well, I could hear the sounds of movement around me. And I... Uh, I had trouble focusing my eyes at first. I saw there was a light above me, and the ceiling was very close. I could feel I was laying on top of some hard raised surface. Um, but when I finally got where I could focus my eyes, and I and I saw these creatures standing over me, I just flipped out. I just instantly became hysterical. I started screaming. I was definitely not in the hospital. And can you describe what these aliens look like? Well, they were basically humanoid, you know, two arms, two legs, like that. But uh, they uh, had very large heads, um, hair, no hair, huge eyes, sort of a pale uh, grayish white skin. And they were wearing uh, coveralls, a kind of a brownish uh, coverall. After spending what Travis remembers to be an hour or two inside the craft, the aliens put a mask over his face and he awoke in the middle of the road with the craft above him. He'd been missing for five days. What do you say to people who, who say, you know, these seven loggers in the woods have just made this whole story up? <laughs> I mean, you know, seven people are, are see the same thing. They stick by their stories for, for over two decades. You know, ever all of us have taken polygraph tests. Every theory the skeptics come up with is just absurd and, and easily proven so. 
Well, I spent a day with Travis and Mike Rogers. He passed the lie detector test. Their story is consistent. There were five other people there, after all, who saw part of these events unfold, and who also passed the lie detector test. Uh, his story is consistent. It's never changed. In a court of law, that would make the case. I found his story uh, profoundly convincing. This is the Saratov Air Base, 200 miles outside Moscow. Behind these barbed wire fences is the Russian equivalent to Area 51. If you thought only the US government had flying disc technology, then you'd be wrong. The Russians have been working on a secret project codenamed Tarielka since the Second World War. Security here is unprecedented, and this perimeter fence is as close as we've been able to get to the base. We did secure some footage of the flying disc in the hangar. The code name for the project is Ekeep, and it has been designed for humans to fly. We asked the scientist in charge of the project what propulsion system the craft uses, but he would not divulge what he called classified information. What is clear is that Tarielka is aimed at the commercial market, not the military. The Russian engineers here at Saratov see this as an alternative to aeroplane transport in the 21st century. Where the production and design expertise came to build the Terielka, no one is saying. But surely it's more than just a coincidence that the base here at Saratov is so similar to Area 51, both in location and security. And as in the US, the Terielka project was started in the 1940s, just after the alleged saucer crash in Roswell, New Mexico. I'm pretty sure that the Russians have those craft. We were told directly by a leading Russian scientist who had worked, hands-on worked on these things, that uh, both the United States and the USSR had, had uh, acquired information from captured Nazi scientists and had built craft like these. They knew that we had them. We knew that they had them. The story I got from the Russians before is uh, that these same scientists who felt that there was an alien connection, Stalin himself, I was told, believed in this alien connection, that these things came from somewhere else. Now, I think because of the political changes and the political uncertainties in that country, even these scientists are, are backing off from that position. Well, we're not quite sure if these are alien anymore. Uh, they're, they're not certain that the Kremlin needs any kind of a UFO expose right now. The Tarielka will be on display at trade shows around the world in a few years' time, sold off to the highest bidder. The fact that mankind may be transported in flying disks in the early part of the 21st century is a startling transition from science fiction into science fact. Have alien sources crashed on Earth? And have we back-engineered these craft to develop our own 21st century flying disks? The answer, however improbable, is yes. Area 51 does exist, and we have eyewitness accounts from at least two former workers at the base who confirm the existence of alien spacecraft. The truth seems to be out there, but will they ever admit it? It's likely to be a very long time before we discover uh, what is actually being done out of Groom Lake now. If you look at the intelligence community particularly, um, they seem to wait anything from 15 to 20 years or more after something has been retired before they acknowledge its existence. Therefore, if things are operational now, we may not see them for another 30, 40 years. What also happens at that point is that things remain secret for so long that the people who originally decided they should be classified are retired or quite possibly dead. And it becomes almost impossible to declassify a program at that point because nobody knows quite why the secret is being protected. The Air Force headquarters files up through 1955, 9,800 feet of material. That's a thousand four drawer filing cabinets. When I went to ask for stuff out of these files, only 10% of the boxes I was interested in had been classification reviewed. 
And in those boxes, there were withdrawal sheets all over the place. So secrets can be kept. They are being kept. One way that they're being kept is the naivete of the people who think, eh, if this was going on, I would know about it. The ego is a powerful weapon. They have to know that it has to come out. And it has to be part of their program that it will come out. We just don't know what the agenda, what the time frame is. I think it's very reasonable, let's say, if contact were made in the 1950s, I think it's very reasonable of the government to say, let's keep it secret for 40 or 50 or 60 years so we can study it, so we can reproduce the craft, so we can understand what it is we're dealing with and release it to society slowly. Perhaps that's what they're doing now. Do you think the secret will be out in a few years' time? I'm saying because I've got permission, I'll turn my papers over to you in 2002. And then you'll know who I am. It's my impression that eventually there will be a weight of evidence uh, so massive that all, uh, society will admit that they are here, and at which point the government will have to admit that they've known a lot more than they've said all along. And this isn't just the U.S. government, you know, this is virtually every government in the world. In 1979, the SETI program was set up to search the far reaches of space for intelligent life. It would seem that we now have an answer. The real reason for the cover-up is likely to be far more sinister than mere secret technology we have to consider that the aliens themselves may be controlling the cover-up, especially if they don't really want us to know what they're doing here. Even if there is some communication between uh, the government and them, everything is being run by the ETs. They're so far beyond us in terms of technology that uh, I don't think we would have a chance. They, the officials in charge of this information, are going to look rather impotent were it known that there are extraterrestrials invading our airspace against whom we have inadequate defense. We have investigated Dreamland for over a year. Whilst we didn't see any flying disks or alien bodies, we did see lights in the sky which could not have been aeroplanes, military or otherwise. We have proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that Area 51 and a large underground base out at Groom Lake does exist. We've seen the workers fly in and out of the facility and talked to alleged former workers at Area 51 about their back engineering of recovered alien spacecraft. We've seen actual footage of man-made flying disks, both American and Russian. And there are warehouses across America housing files like these, full of UFO reports and alien abductions. Is this body of evidence just a figment of someone's imagination? I think not. As we move closer to millennium, mankind will have to face up to the startling reality that we may not be alone, and that a select group of US government officials have known about this for some time. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. And yet, I ask you, is not an alien force already among us?